Hi, and welcome back to Ivy English. I'm Karen, and I'm Chris Gorski. Today is October twenty first, and we're on page fifty nine in your magazines. And today we're going to hear part two of the article that we started yesterday, entitled "The Rocket Boys Who Reached for the Stars." Now, when we just started out with the article, neither Chris nor I had much idea of what the heck this was about. But we've already read part one, so now we know. Where we're going? If you did not hear yesterday's program, I advise you to take a little break, pause the video, and kind of mark it for later, and go back and listen to part one because part two won't make that much much sense without it. In fact, yesterday at the end, we, we were kind of touching upon the ideas that、um, it's unusual that in 1903 the the first flight takes off, in 1957 we have the first satellite, 1969 we have people walking on the moon. That's an incredible technological achievement. And there are many, many, many large technological innovations that took place out of what we called the space race, which is more or less what happened after Sputnik reached orbit. Which also tells you a lot about one of the functions of competition. If you are living very comfortably, you may not really try hard to accomplish a lot. You just want to live comfortably and happily day to day. But the U.S. was. Challenged by the Soviet Union, when they send up Sputnik, we kind of panic, like, "Oh man, we cannot let them get ahead of us." Yeah, and in fact, the United States was aiming to send satellites. That was satellites into space. This was always on the table. This was always a goal for the U.S. But here, the Soviet Union, this supposedly backwater, technologically poor country,、um, ended up beating the U.S. to it. And there's a whole interesting side of the history of but the Russians and how they. Ended up sending Sputnik into into space, but it's kind of neither here nor there. It's not really relevant to what we're talking about, but it all does come down to competition, and I completely agree with Karen with that. And actually, it does relate to what we're talking about. I'm going to read you one sentence from yesterday's lesson. After watching the Russian satellite Sputnik sail into space, he, which is Homer Sonny Hickam Jr., who we're still talking about today. He dreams of building rockets for the U.S. government. So he was one of the people who was directly affected by and inspired by this achievement of the Soviet Union. We did not want to fall behind. One of the interesting technological developments that came out of Sputnik was actually the GPS that you use in your cell phone、uh, and GPS you use in your cars. And, and the way it worked, it's, it's incredibly simple. It uses basic math and Sputnik.、Um, Sputnik had a little radio receiver and make a beep. When it flew around the Earth, and it moved around eight kilometers a second over Earth, and as it got closer to the United States, the beeps would get louder, 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 and when it passed by, it would get quieter, 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 just like an ambulance does in real life. It goes, "Wow!" Sounds、and、like that, the Doppler effect. That's exactly it—the Doppler effect. And scientists realized that you could know exactly where Sputnik was in outer space with very simple math, using basically the Pythagorean theorem: a a a squared b squared equals c squared. And they realize that if I know where Sputnik is, then I can also actually know exactly where I am, and that was the birth of the GPS. That's right. And when sometimes people get a little impatient with their GPS that it's not reacting fast enough, you just have to consider this long trip that it makes <laughs> going and coming to get back to your cell phone. Yeah, it's it's really incredibly simple yet useful technology. Okay, our title again: the Rocket Boys who reached for the stars. We're going to continue with part two now. Rocket Boys is a memoir based on the early years of its author Homer Hickam. Inspired by a blossoming interest in rockets, Hickam would study engineering at Virginia Tech University. Shortly after graduation, he enrolled in the U.S. Army and fought in the Vietnam War. After returning home, he took up writing and began writing about his life experiences and military history. Rocket Boys was his second book, and it won him many literary awards. In 1999, it was adapted into a Hollywood film and renamed October Sky. A central theme in the book is the concept of a Cold War. The book is set during the late 1950s in the Cold War era, when tensions between the Soviet Union and the U.S. were at an all-time high. However, Sonny also describes a Cold War that was brewing inside of his own home. Because his family members tended to keep their feelings locked up inside, the atmosphere was frequently tense in their household and seemed ready to explode at any time. The book also deals with the idea of progress and exploring a new frontier. Sunny is lucky in the sense that he grows up in a special time. 
His life changes forever when he learns that the Soviets have sent a satellite into space. The event gives him direction and a meaningful goal that he can strive to achieve. The theme of new frontiers is reflected locally as well. During the 1950s and 60s, changes in technology and society awarded Sonny with career opportunities that weren't available to his parents. This presented him with a possibility of leaving his hometown and deciding his own future. And although his father has trouble accepting this new reality, he seems to have finally come to grips with the developments at the conclusion of the story. All right, so this gives us an overview of the one of the books that Sonny Hickam wrote called Rocket Boys. Let's go back to the beginning. Rocket Boys is a memoir based on the early years of its author, Homer Hickam. A memoir in Chinese, just think of memory and a record. It's a it's about your life. It's the things that you remember from your life. You organize them into a book. We use the French word for that. We call it a memoir. Or sometimes we add S. Those are his memoirs. It's also okay. Next so, sentence. Go ahead. So this is a slightly different than an autobiography. An autobiography is a book written strictly about your life. But a big focus of this book is also the Cold War, Sputnik, and his career because of that. And so that, that's what separates the two. So we have his, his life story, but also this larger event happening around it. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, that's an excellent memoir about not actually about a real person. But it's this person with the idea of history happening around him. Oh, that's right. That's right. And so an autobiography, we would expect to be more systematic, yeah. kind of like more evenly paced. But a memoir, you're mostly going to write about the things that stand out most in memory. Inspired by a blossoming interest in rockets, Hickam would study engineering at Virginia Tech University. So he starts out by trying to build a rocket himself with friends and with the encouragement of his teacher. And then he goes on to actually study it at the university. Virginia Tech University is still a very, very famous and highly prestigious university. Underline this word blossoming, that means to grow in a positive way. We're going to use another word that, that is similar, but is most definitely not positive later. Right. Blossoming is for a flower to open. We can also say blooming, but in this context, we would not say blooming. So the flower is blooming, the flower is blossoming if it's literal, but here it's actually not literal. So they say a blossoming interest. That means it's growing stronger and stronger. Shortly after graduation, he enrolled in the U.S. Army and fought in the Vietnam War. Now, all of that is pretty straightforward, but I have the feeling that a lot of you are not very familiar with the Vietnam War. If you have time, just go to Wikipedia and read up about it so you know a bit about that period of history. It's very important. I, I'm interested in, in the way the Vietnam War uh, impacted your own life. I, were, were you... In, involved in supporting, opposing it in any major way? Oh, you can guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I. it's funny because my own parents, my dad, was, my mom and dad were kind of hippies. Mm -hmm. and But at the same time, my dad was in the service. In fact, uh, wow. most of my brothers were. Wow. And they, they, I think they have a very mixed kind of, it, they, they probably would not be able to explain all their various positions that they held. They were hippies that opposed the Vietnam War, but they were in the he was in the service. Later on, my dad was pretty conservative. Mm. Uh, yeah, there, there were all go. these mixed up, jumbled emotions that that he felt about things. All the con all the contradictions that absolutely. we humans are full of. Yeah. Now, I was it's the same as now, just very liberal, absolutely against it. I participated in some anti war activities and things. We rapped, R-A-P-P-E-D. It wasn't rap music back then. To rap at that period, I want to use a Chinese word. I'm going to cheat. It's Qing Tan. Okay. In China, you had Qing Tan. That's when you'd get together and you would discuss Taoism. Yeah. Well, we would do something really similar in the 60s and 70s. We would get together in a coffee house and people would smoke and drink or have coffee or whatever. And they would talk about mostly about the Vietnam War. It, 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 in case you're wondering, now Karen said the word they rapped. That is actually the origin of the word of rap music. Right. So it's yeah. kind of like a talking music, right? Especially early rap, you can really hear that. And that's actually the origin of rap music. So there's a really interesting connection between those Vietnam protests, those early discussions, and what eventually turned into hip hop or rap music. That's right. So it became corny after a while, just like the word groovy. That word went out of fashion before it went in fa into fashion. 
but somebody would say, hey, you want to wrap. That means you just want to <laughs> sit down and discuss important issues of the day, especially the Vietnam War. Yeah, I was very much part of that. All right. So um, Sonny Hickam here graduated, and then he went into the Army. Now, it doesn't say whether he volunteered or whether he was drafted. You don't have to go into the military at the time. You didn't have to go into the service immediately if you were studying, if while you were still a student or if you had some other very good reason for not going. But after he graduated, he no longer had that reason, so he may have been drafted. That means he had no choice. Eventually, America got rid of the draft. So we now have an all-volunteer army, and Taiwan has been working towards the same thing. But in any case, after he graduated, he went into the, it says enrolled, he probably did it voluntarily. He went into the U.S. Army, and then he fought in the Vietnam War, and then he lived to tell the tale. Okay. After returning home, he took up writing and began writing about his life experiences and military history. So here he was, this basically engineer who was really interested in rockets, experienced the war firsthand, and then he came back from the war and wrote about it. When we take up writing, that just means you begin to do this as a career. Rocket Boys was his second book, and it won him many literary awards. So he obviously did a really, really good job on this book. It might be something you want to read. In 1999, it was adapted into a Hollywood film and renamed October Sky. So if you want to read it in a more palatable form, a form that's a little bit easier to assimilate, you might want to just watch the movie. I I will say that. I remember this name of this movie, but I didn't see it, and I, I have no idea how famous it was. I probably should have looked that up, but I was just curious about it. But it is – there's something about the word October and the Cold War that often gets kind of assimilated. There are several other famous movies, The Hunt for Red October. For Red October, That's right. right. The submarine movie. Um, there's something about this period of time, the Cold War and the fall that are for some reason connected, and I don't know what that connection is. The October Revolution. Uh, oh, Maybe, of Russia. Yeah, right. So, yes, there's a lot of reasons why October would be associated with that. Okay, let's move on to the next paragraph. A central theme in the book is the concept of a Cold War. All right, we've been talking a lot about what the Cold War is. People were not fighting actual wars with guns, but they really hated each other and they were sniping at each other. S-N-I-P-E, sniping, that means you attack somebody out of nowhere and rather than a, in a sort of agreed upon war. Our next sentence begins, the book is set during the late 1950s in the Cold War era when tensions between the Soviet Union and the U.S. were at an all-time high. Well, this is a really good chunk to learn, at an all-time high. You're going to find that in many contexts. Just repeat it enough times so that it'll just kind of spill out of your mouth when you need to use it. And this was a period that Chris says he was not that interested in. But I am fascinated because of all the stuff going on under the surface during the Cold War and because it was my own childhood. Our next sentence says, however, Sonny also describes a Cold War that was brewing inside of his own home. Now, that's interesting because he's drawing a parallel. Although it seems like nothing terrible is happening on the surface, like I said, a lot of stuff is going on under the surface and it could actually explode at any time. So... It, the next line will tell us more about why that happened. However, before we get there, we see that in these past few sentences, we have a Cold War that's either not capitalized or is capitalized. Of course, we're talking about Cold War era in the second sentence here. Capital C, capital W. We're talking about the end of World War II until 1989. That's this official period in history that we talk about. When we talk about the lowercase Cold Wars, just like Karen was was saying here, that people aren't openly yelling, shouting, or maybe shooting guns and doing these things, there are a lot of tensions. All right. And I want to say one more thing about the small letter C and W Cold War. A lot of people who are in a couple, you know, whether it's opposite sex or same sex, doesn't matter anybody in a relationship. When they're upset with each other, they will sometimes engage in Cold War tactics with each other. That means they can live in the same house, but they don't talk to each other. <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> never, ever, ever, ever do it. I can tell you two things you should never do in a relationship. One is never engage in Cold War. Never. The other thing is never hang up on anybody. Never do that. Just bow. Bye. Never do that. Those two things are so hurtful. Never do those things. Now, 
way up at the top of the paragraph, uh, top of the story, in our second sentence, we had the word blossoming, blossoming, which which means growing and it's positive. Here we have the word brewing, mm. like making beer, and this also kind of sort of means blossoming to open to grow. But this is most definitely a negative word. Underline this, and I actually drew a line right across my paper from blossoming to the word brewing. One positive being blossoming. Brewing most definitely negative. Right. For example, trouble is brewing. Yeah. That means things are getting worse and worse. The alcoholic content is getting higher and higher. That means it's more and more potent. It's more and more powerful. Our next sentence says, because his family members tended to keep their feelings locked up inside, the atmosphere was frequently tense in their household and seemed ready to explode at any time. Now. I'm guessing that most of you have been in a situation where that was the case, and especially in East Asian culture. I think in all East Asian countries, you are taught to not say or do negative things. So that means that you have to hold a lot of things inside. You might get really, really angry and resentful. And students have told me that when their parents would say, "Oh, don't argue with them. Just put up with it. Tolerate it." They get really upset because some things are so unfair, and they just have to tolerate it. So you really have to find a way to express your feelings. Try not to be in that situation. You will have to slowly let off steam, slowly let the pressure go down. Otherwise, it's very unhealthy for everybody and quite dangerous. I love all the phrases and expressions we're using here. So we were just talking about brewing, which means to make like alcohol or brew trouble, and then we have feelings locked up inside. We'll often talk about feelings being bottled up. That means to put something in a bottle. Cork it or stop it so it can't come out, and that will build the gas pressure, or it will change something from, say, like grape juice into wine. And then you were just saying other phrases related, exactly, letting off steam, letting off steam, which yep. when you slowly open a container, the steam will kind of come out, just like you would with a bottle of soda pop. That's right. So do not let things build up. You have to deal with them. Find a way. All right, our last paragraph. The book also deals with the idea of progress and exploring a new frontier. Now that was another exciting thing about growing up in the '60s and '70s. I mean, the thing about putting a man on the moon was just so amazing, and that was not the only achievement. That was just the crowning achievement. It was like the most obvious one. But science and technology were steadily developing this whole time, or we would not have been able to put somebody on the moon. And so, when you look at now, you think, "Wow, our technology is so advanced." That's because it was constantly, constantly evolving during this period. Did you watch the moon landing? Yes, of course. Well, it was it was like in midday, like they planned it, so it was like where everyone was able to watch it. Is that correct? The teachers played it in the classroom. I'm sure everywhere in America. You know what they played in our classroom? No, the Challenger. Oh, oh, I see. That's right. You're younger, of course. <laughs> yeah. So Challenger was the space shuttle that ex- unfortunately exploded, and the teachers they want the the teachers wanted us to watch this amazing science moment. And they even put a real life teacher on the space shuttle Challenger, and when it flew up, it just exploded. And like all, oh, I was very young, yeah. and it was like I remember my teacher freaking out, running and like turning off the TV. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We just watched all these people pretty much die. It was terrible. So the other defining incidents were when I was in third grade. It was President Kennedy being assassinated. Oh right. Oh man, I remember the clothes I was wearing. Everybody remembers. Really? Yes. Was it like over the announcement or just like the we teacher watched it on in? TV? Oh my goodness! Yes, they had the announcement, and then we would watch it on TV. Oh my gosh! And then, of course, it was nine eleven. Nine eleven. Yeah, nine eleven. I was in college. I remember seeing that right out of class. I remember watching that. Yeah. So all of these. These incidents, because they are so unusual, they will really, really stick with you, and they get played over so many times. Oh, they yeah. make a deep impression. But it, on it you. definitely is some of those moments where you know exactly where you were exactly at that time. Just what like you, you were said, wearing. You, you remember what you were wearing. That's yeah. exactly right. And I was only eight years old. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Next sentence. Sunny is lucky in the sense that he grows up in a special time, and we've been saying that. For me, I think it was a special time. Looking back at the Twilight Zone now. I just think, man, that was a magical time. So much stuff was happening. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Like I said, I personally don't love Cold War history, but that doesn't mean there's not interesting stuff there. And there are a lot of people that are greatly fascinated by it. It's just not my cup of tea, which means it's not something that I especially love. I can get that, but like when I watch, you know, these、um, TV shows from the '60s, I think. There was a whole bunch of stuff that was going by me that I just heard a little bit about, and now I'm seeing it as an adult, and I, that's really fascinating to me. 
His life changes forever when he learns that the Soviets have sent a satellite into space. We've already spent quite a bit of time talking about Sput- Sputnik being sent into space. The event gives him direction and a meaningful goal that he can strive to achieve. There's an important lesson in that sentence, and that is when something terrible happens to us, we experience a loss, somebody dies, gets sick, there's an accident, we didn't get the position we wanted, get into the school we wanted, all this stuff that can go wrong. We're going to be really upset and angry at first, but when you kind of recover and calm down, you often end up doing something great because you have had to meet this challenge, get angry at it, and do something even better. Yeah, a, a phrase I, I like to keep in mind that chaos is a ladder. Uh, when, yeah. when bad things happen, th- there's also opportunities for you to, to, to do better, to change, or to grow. Something really awful happened in my personal life, and then I got so mad that I decided to finish my PhD. Really? That's why. It's because of this personal life issue. I was just so upset. I thought, I'm not going to let this be bad. I'm turning this bad to good. And that's why I finished my PhD. In the end at Taida, I retired as an associate professor. And people said, well, why didn't you go for a full professor? It's because nothing terrible enough happened. I had a good life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. <laughs> that's really it. It didn't push me. Okay. The theme of new frontiers is reflected locally as well. So in addition to this international scene between the U.S. and Russia, or the Soviet Union at the time, there was also local things going on that affected him as well. During the 1950s and 60s, changes in technology and society awarded Sonny with career opportunities that weren't available to his parents. There's so many things we can do now because we have the tools and the technology. They wouldn't have been possible earlier without all the people before us who built up to this point. It's it's incredible to think, and I know 150 years sounds like a really long time, but imagine the world 150 years ago, and imagine a child being born at the beginning of that 150 years, and then by the time they were a grandma. Basically, the, the end of slavery in the United yeah. States, was, it was like three grandmas' lives back to back to back. That's it. Um, maybe not even that. Um it's it's really we lived through an incredibly remarkable period of transformation. Someone from two, three generations ago lived in a world that was virtually unrecognizable to the world we live in today. That's true of the technology, but I'm afraid that our spiritual development has not kept pace. I'm with you there. We're going to have to do something about that, not just about machines and silicon and everything like that. We're going to have to work on our spiritual development. Actually, one thing in the Twilight Zone that also shocks me is that a number of the actors who I see were born around 1880. Yeah, right, right. during that that incredible (laughs) transformation, right? There was somebody born in the 1800s in this TV show that I watched as a kid. Uh, That was shocking. (laughs) Okay. This presented him with the possibility of leaving his hometown and deciding his own future. And this sentence now makes me think of Chris, because that's what Chris did. But but the, I was just, I was literally just thinking, that's what you and I both did. We both did it. We, we both, both were it. thinking at a certain point in our life, we might love, like our home, like I personally love Buffalo, but I had to go. It was time for me to go. The funny thing is, my daughter moved back to my hometown. That's, true. <laughs> <laughs> that's another story for another day. And although his father has trouble accepting this new reality, he seems to have finally come to grips with the developments at the conclusion of the story. I like the ending of that because yesterday, I mean, Dad kind of comes off as not a very terribly warm and comforting person to a child. Uh, you know, he liked his gifted athlete of a son and kind of poo-pooed. He downplayed the achievements of his nerd math-focused son and then wasn't even willing to go see the rocket blast off that hundreds of other people were going because dad might be proven wrong. But he finally comes around. And there's, I suppose there's a redemption arc in there where we can learn from our own mistakes. One of my Facebook friends just posted a quote I thought was very good, is that when you're getting old, you finally become the person that you should be. Yeah. And in many ways, that's true. So don't be afraid of old age. Think, oh, they're just a bunch of old fogies and it's a terrible time of life. As long as you can stay healthy, you end up usually being happier and a better person when you're older. Yeah, you can move past those the, the youthful arrogance. That's right. That's right. And kind of con- practice a little more self-control and think of others a little more. That's it for today. Please tune in next time. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.